So good evening everybody. This is my take on wildlife photography. Not so much a lecture, more an excuse to show some of my favourite wildlife photos. And along the way I'll be perhaps giving a few pointers, a few hints and tips on wildlife photography, some do's and don'ts, and perhaps just one or two technicalities, I'll skip over most of those if they're not particularly interesting to everybody, about uh, the technicalities of the photography, shutter speeds and apertures, etc. Some people are interested in the details of how the photos are taken. The intention really is just to show you what you can do and how you might be able to improve your own attempts at photographing wildlife, regardless of whether it's from safaris in Africa or whether it's just things in your back garden. So I'll be looking at uh, the composition, framing the subject, looking at how you can best focus, looking at the lighting of the object that you're photographing, a little bit about shutter speed and aperture, and then something about the context of the animal in its surroundings. And also a very valuable part of all photography is basically making the most of good luck and serendipity. So firstly, let's just have a quick think about composition. It's not that unusual for me when I'm taking digital images to find that I take a picture and then later decide if I need to frame it slightly differently. But you may ask yourself, if the animal is a long distance away, don't you always need a big telephoto lens to do any serious wildlife photography? In other words, should we all be investing in equipment like this? This brave young man with the biceps seems to be holding quite a few kilograms of telephoto lens there. And some people who are interested in bird watching and photographing birds do indeed end up buying some rather large telephoto lenses. But I find that uh, with a digital SLR camera, the best lens for me is a 300 millimeter lens. You can get away with a little less. Uh, anything longer focal length I find is a bit heavy and a bit cumbersome. So there you, uh, in the bottom left there, you see a 300 millimeter lens in the palm of a hand. It's not that big, it's not that weighty. And hence walking around with a camera with that lens on is not that big a deal. And no, I don't think you really need anything much bigger than that. Can you get close enough to animals even with a mere 300 millimeter lens? Well, there's a nice picture of a male lion and to give you an idea of the distance between me as the photographer and the lion, there's a picture taken by one of my friends that I went on safari with. And you can see that lions and other predators, generally speaking, are quite happy if you approach to within 10 meters, sometimes even less than that. Prey animals can be a little more skittish, but predators don't see tourists as a threat, and so they're quite happy for you to approach them within a few tens of meters or even a few meters and get a close-up shot with a very modest telephoto lens. Here's the picture I used for the splash screen. At the time, I framed the lioness in the middle of the, uh, the frame, but later I decided maybe it would have been better if I'd framed it slightly differently and put the lioness off center. In other words, had I framed it slightly differently, then perhaps it makes a slightly more interesting photo to put the lioness to one side and have her looking over her shoulder into the picture. But of course, the advantage of digital photography is when you snap a picture and you get lots of pixels in your image, it's quite reasonable to crop that image and still end up with a very nice frame. With film in the old days, if you blew up a small part of your image, there's always the danger that it could look a little bit grainy. But with digital images, we don't have that particular problem. So in this particular case, I reframed and cropped the images slightly differently once I got home. And I occasionally changed my mind. Here's a picture of a lion. This particular lion actually has a broken paw, though I didn't realize that until afterwards. And it's hobbling down to the waterside here. But that's not the full frame. That's just part of the original image. If we have a look at more of the image, we see a little bit of a surprise. In the reflection in the water, there's actually a lioness behind the lion. And you could argue that that particular framing is quite interesting to get the lion and its reflection and to get the female lioness sitting in the background. The full frame itself included at the very top the lioness. But in a sense, that spoils the surprise of seeing the lioness in the reflection. 
So there's always that option of take a picture and then later think, well, actually, it might be a more interesting picture if we crop it slightly differently. So let's have a think about how we make sure the picture is essentially as good as we can get it, keeping things nice and sharp. One thing to bear in mind is if you want to do any sort of photography, you really have to know how your camera works. So different cameras work in different ways. And when you point at a subject like this, the camera might decide that that's the best thing to focus on. But some cameras will focus in different areas. In this case, the background is deliberately out of focus. But maybe the camera will try and focus on the tree or perhaps even focus on the leaf. Some cameras prefer to focus on the nearest object and assume that's what's of interest and everything else is in the background. So it's a good idea to make sure you're familiar with your camera to make sure you know how the focusing and the exposure works to make sure you get the most out of it. For some birds in trees, this can be a major problem because birds are often in branches of trees and there are often branches in front of the bird, between the bird and you, and the camera will often try and focus on the branch in front of the bird rather than keep that branch out of focus and keep the bird nicely focused. Remember, no matter how intelligent the camera says it is, the camera does not know what it is that you're intending to photograph. It simply sees lots of objects in the field of view and takes a guess as to what it's trying to focus on if you leave it completely in autofocus rather than focus on what you know to be the object you're interested in. In this particular case, not a big deal because the bird is at roughly the same distance as all the foliage around it and hence everything was kept in nice sharp focus. Animals walking towards you can be a little bit of a problem because, of course, the focus distance is continuously changing. And if you've got a very clever camera, perhaps it can track that focus and keep the object in focus. In, the, in this particular case, our driver guide of uh, our friend, my friends and I going on safari in Africa. Seems we have somebody in the waiting room. OK. Let me just get rid of the window. So in this particular case, uh, my friends and I went on safari in Africa and our driver guide saw this leopard come in and said, don't worry too much about catching it now, because if we move a little bit further over, this leopard is going to come very close to us. And he was right, because very shortly thereafter, the leopard came to within a few meters of our safari van and hence because the leopard was not worried about us being an apex predator, it's not that fussed about tourists being around as long as we don't scare its prey away. And so it was quite happy to come within a few meters of us and allow us to get beautiful close up shots. When it comes to focusing, one thing I forgot is that here I was trying to focus on this cormorant and catch its reflection in the water. I forgot about the fact that the reflection is slightly further away than the bird itself and I didn't quite get the focus right. But depending on how large you blow up this image, it still looks OK because the bird and the reflection are both close enough to being in focus that it doesn't really matter too much. I like this particular composition, not least because the tail of the cormorant is just touching the water and producing a few ripples where the tail touches the reflection of the tail. Here I got it again slightly wrong. Here we have a, a mother and fawn impala. They were originally walking through this area and it seems they didn't want to get their hooves wet and so jumped over this rather muddy region in the middle. And I wasn't quite expecting that and hence I hadn't worked out where the focus was going to be and hence these two animals are not quite in focus. This is a rather confusing shot because it's difficult to work out what is water and what is sky. Actually, it's both water. We're looking down into a pool which has a little spit of green across the middle. So both of these are reflections in water and there's no sky at all in this particular frame. Let's have a think about lighting. Although you can get some very nice pictures in the middle of the day, it's often a rather flat illumination when the sun is overhead. 
in this particular case for this baby zebra, this foal, you can see the sun is overhead if you look at its shadow. The shadow is not cast to one side or another. The shadow is essentially basically underneath the animal. So the light is coming down directly from above and that produces a rather flat illumination. It's often better to try and get the sun to one side or possibly even behind the animal. In this case you can see because the sun is behind the animal the sun is just glinting off the horns and highlighting some of the fur of the animal's pelt and that often makes a more interesting shot than having the sun overhead. That means taking the pictures perhaps in the early morning and the late afternoon rather than in the middle of the day. And again, another example with the sun behind the animal, it picks up some of the fur, in this case, the beard of this, uh, of this wildebeest. And one of my favourite shots taken on safari a few years ago, this little family portrait of zebras was taken shortly after sunrise. So the sun is over in the far left of the image. And it's a nice family portrait of zebras doing what zebras do, which is basically not much in particular other than wandering around and eating the grass. In this particular case, one zebra has got its head up, just keeping an eye for any possible predators on the horizon. All the others are just tucking into their breakfast. And either in the early morning or often in the late afternoon, as you head towards sunset, that's a good time for getting the light behind the animal. In this case, the light is picking up the dust of this zebra as it's uh, kicking its way across the plain. And similarly for zebras crossing here in front of a few disinterested wildebeest. But there's always the opportunity to pick up reflections in water if you can find animals close to a river or close to a watering hole. That's one of the advantages of a watering hole. Not only do the animals come to drink, you often get some beautiful reflections. This particular collection of antelope called Eland, one of the largest antelopes in East Africa, this was caught in the early morning. So the sun is just rising over my right shoulder and uh, illuminating the Eland. And because the water is relatively still, apart from the ripples they make when drinking, it gives a very nice um, photo of them with their reflections. This was actually taken quite a few years ago before the days of digital. So this was actually taken on slide film, but it's such a nice shot. I like it. Perhaps I didn't frame it quite right, but it's just beautiful illumination. Again, in the early morning sun, the zebra is just standing in a very shallow lake, barely a centimeter or so deep, giving this impression that it's walking on water and staring off into the distance and I've got no idea what's going through the mind of a zebra but it seemed such a peaceful tranquil picture I just had to grab this one. So a little bit of technicality let's not go overboard on this but thinking a little bit about shutter speed and lens aperture for those of you who like your photography and know uh, about the details of the choice of shutter speed how long you expose for and the choice of aperture what iris setting you set for letting light into the lens. In this particular case, uh, a butterfly in the shade, there wasn't much light um, and I opened up the lens to let as much light in as possible. Gives you limited depth of field in terms of focus, but because the butterfly was relatively flat, it didn't matter that different bits of it would be in focus and other bits not because it's a relatively plain surface that I'm photographing here. And for those that are interested, I will just in this section show the shutter speed and aperture down in the bottom of the, uh, the slide here. These cheetah came very close to us one evening when the sun was almost gone. And so I had very little light to play with. And so the shutter speed, rather than being quite fast to capture the animal, was actually much longer than I was hoping for. It was about 1 40th of a second. And in 1 40th of a second, if your subject isn't moving, it will look quite sharp. But in this case, two cheetahs were running so fast that I couldn't possibly freeze the action. And so we've got two cheetahs running past the safari van at very high speed. They're just a couple of brothers who I think were just playing. They weren't chasing an animal. They weren't trying to feed. They were just running past having some fun. And as one of them curved away, again, I was trying to move the camera to follow the animal and it blurred horribly. But of course, at the end of the day, it gives a rather 
artistic impression of just how fast a cheetah can be. Although that wasn't deliberately what I was going for, that's the end result. If you have the choice of what aperture to set, how much you open up the lens, then the further you open up the lens, the more limited the depth of field, which means you'll get your subject in focus and throw the background completely out of focus if you choose it correctly. So although you might choose to let your camera just select the aperture and speed automatically with its choice, if you do have the choice, it's a good idea to open up the lens as much as possible to get that background out of focus and then your subject really stands out nice and sharply against the background and it really makes it pop. Similarly for this particular bird, a goshawk sitting in a tree, the background is nicely out of focus because the aperture was f5.6 rather than stopping down any further. It's a little bit confused in terms of what's going on in the bottom of the picture in, because the foliage is all in focus but at least the head and the main body of the bird again are sharp against a blurred background. So again it shows up uh, nicely against the background. Same was true of this particular lion, it wasn't that far away, but again, by making sure the background's out of focus, then the soft mane of the lion shows up nicely and doesn't blur into the background, so the mane, even though it's very uh, feathery, does stand out very nicely. In this particular case, I was shooting some bee eaters on a branch, and the branch is moving away from me. The right-hand part of the branch is closer than the left-hand part of the branch, and I knew that there was a limited depth of field. I knew it might be difficult to get all four birds in focus. And I was, uh, this was a, a river boat trip, and so I couldn't afford to go to a, a, very, um, a very slow aperture, sorry, a very slow speed, simply because I knew that on a boat I was going to be rocking around a bit, so I couldn't go to a slow speed, had to keep the speed reasonably fast, in this case one thousandth of a second, and so I couldn't stop the lens down to try and get all four birds in focus. So I had to put up with the fact that the end birds are in focus and the chap on the right is out of focus. Maybe that doesn't matter so much because he's got his back to us anyway, but there we go. Sometimes you do have to trade off one against the other. Focus versus shutter speed, which might determine whether the object moves or not, or blurs or not. Birds in flight can be an issue because quite often you're trying to follow them with your camera and you would like a nice fast shutter speed to try and freeze any action. But also, if you're not absolutely convinced you've got the distance right and got the focusing right, you would like to shut down the lens, reduce the aperture to try and give you the depth of field that keeps the bird sharp. And again, it's a trade-off between the two. I found quite often if I leave my camera on automatic, it doesn't do too bad a job of selecting the shutter speed and selecting the aperture. In this particular case, I really wanted a fast um, shutter speed because these particular e um, vultures were scrapping with each other. They seemed to be having a bit of an argument and uh, there was an awful lot of action so I wanted the shutter speed to be as fast as possible, in this particular case a little faster than one thousandth of a second, to try and freeze the action as they were fighting. And again the automatic exposure did a reasonable job but I just changed it slightly to try and make it as fast as possible. Again, when birds are in the sky, it can sometimes be difficult to follow them. It depends what size bird you're talking about and how fast it's flying. In the case of raptors, like this auger buzzard, this one was soaring. It was sitting on a thermal going relatively slowly round and round. And if you position yourself in the right place and watch the birds as they circle on thermals, you can often simply put yourself in the right place, knowing that the bird is going to come round every minute or so, and so you can be ready for it. And because they're soaring rather than flying fast, you can often catch them even with a relatively modest shutter speed of, in this case, one three hundredth of a second. And because they're soaring above your head, you can often catch them even when they're only a few tens of meters away. And so you can get a nice close up shot like this. Let's have a think about context. 
Whenever you're photographing an animal, sometimes it's quite important to think about what's in the background. So in this particular case, this is uh, elephants in Kenya. And although elephants in the context of the open savannah is interesting, what I was hoping to get here was to pick up the mountain Kilimanjaro in the background, which you can only just see because it's a rather misty day. You can perhaps just see the ice cap of Kilimanjaro right at the top there. But it wasn't quite the photo I was hoping for because I really wanted to get the iconic picture of elephants and Kilimanjaro. But that was simply not the best day to do that. But it is worth reminding yourself that sometimes it's not necessarily a good idea to zoom in and crop as tightly as possible on the animal because sometimes the environment of the animal is just as important. And in this particular case, I like this photo because it shows a bull elephant, it's picking up some dust in its trunk and throwing it around, hence the dusty environment. But you also get this impression that this elephant is basically in charge. It's emerging from the bush and the bush is its territory. And if it had cropped, if I'd cropped this any tighter, you wouldn't have got this impression of an elephant walking its way through the bush of East Africa. And so I think in many cases, you have to ask yourself, is it only the animal you're trying to photograph or is it the animal in, in its natural habitat that you're trying to capture? In this case, a jackal actually walked a little bit closer than we were expecting. And this jackal was only a few meters away. And you can see I've just about frozen its head and the rest of its body is moving slightly. But a jackal doesn't often show itself by appearing right in front of your lens cap, as it were. It's much more likely that you're going to see animals in the long grass at a distance. And on safari, you spend a fair bit of your time with the binoculars looking at the horizon, trying to see what animals are out there. They're not always so obliging as to come right up to you. And this is not atypical as to what you see. Quite often you just see a pair of ears in the grass and then you realise there's an animal attached to them. Sometimes the grass can be quite long. In some cases the grass can be so long it can hide even a large animal. OK, we can argue as to whether the giraffe is standing up or sitting down in this particular picture. But it's quite clear that if a large animal like a giraffe is barely visible, then the grass must be quite high. That will depend on the season. If you, are, if you are thinking of going on safari to see animals, regardless of whether you just want to see them or whether you want to photograph them, you do have to have a little bit of a think about what season you go in because the grass changes quite dramatically with the rains that come and go during the year and also comes and goes with the, the herbivores, the grazers that move across the country. So this particular shot that I showed you earlier, for instance, you can see the grass is quite short, just a few centimetres in length. And so the wildebeest and the zebra and the other herbivores are quite happy to munch on this grass. But at different times of the year, the grass can be perhaps a metre tall. And of course, that will make it difficult to see some of the smaller animals. Here's an African jacana, one of the lily trotter family. And you can see it's a lily trotter because you can see the lilies. Now, if you think about it, you could say, well, I'm more interested in the bird than the environment. So you could say, OK, I'll crop that picture. And then you have a very nice picture of the jacana with, with the blue patch on its head, etc. But I think, again, because it's a lily trotter, it's better to actually take in the whole thing and remind yourself this is a huge lily pond or lake and the bird is only a small part of that. But it puts the bird in perspective. It keeps the bird in its context. Serendipity. There's an awful lot of good luck. You might go on any wildlife venture hoping to take a picture of a given animal. But a lot of the time it's pure fluke. It's pure good or bad luck as to what animals happen to end up in front of your lens. My friends and I went out on a game drive one day and saw this. And you look at that and you think, what is going on here? It looks like a bird whose head has exploded. Is this bird just having a bad hair day? Turns out not. A few seconds later, it turned its head and we realised it's uh, simply a young raptor. And like uh, a lot of raptors, like owls, for instance, they can turn their heads through essentially 360 degrees. But if it happens to be looking behind it, 
as it can do, then the feathers on the back of its neck start to ruffle and so you get this rather odd looking effect, which we really weren't expecting. We just happened to catch that bird at the instant it was looking in a different direction. A lot of antelopes walk around on four legs, but some of them occasionally get onto their hind legs because that allows them to reach some of the higher and juicier bits of foliage. Jaranooks are antelopes that are famous for walking around on their hind legs and uh, going to the higher parts of bushes, so occasionally you will see that. This was pure serendipity in the sense that a crowned crane was sitting on top of a tree. I looked at the crowned crane, I thought that might make an interesting photo, so I lined up my 300mm lens on the crowned crane on the left at the top of the tree, and just as I was about to take the picture, I noticed that a second bird, presumably its mate, was flying up from behind and then landed next to the first one. And as it comes into land, the air brakes go out and it extends its wings to slow it down so that it can land softly on top of the tree. And so I caught it just as it was coming in, and by pure fluke, the first bird just happens to have its head nestling underneath the wing of the second bird that's landing. I couldn't have chosen that frame any better, and it was purely good luck that I happened to be in the right place at the right time to catch that image. Lions are easier to photograph simply because they do most of their hunting at night, and so during the day they do nothing in particular other than lie around under a tree, quite happy for tourists to come along and photograph them. In this case, a couple of youngsters, a couple of young brothers are just play fighting, and again, they basically ignore the tourists and just give you a lot of nice photo opportunities. In this particular case, uh, a youngster is taking advantage of having breakfast while mum just lies in the sun and warms up a little bit. Lions will always try and find shade in the heat of the day, and so all you really need to do if you want to find lions is go and look underneath trees, and you will often find in any part of the savannah, you will often find a lion or, or other predators that are just hunkering down during the heat of the day, trying to cool off in the, in the shade. And depending, again, at what time of year you go, you may be lucky enough to find a few youngsters, in this case uh, a new addition to the pride, a young lion cub. And also, I think in the same year, we happen to find a, a young cheetah cub with its mother as well. And these youngsters can be incredibly cute when you get them fairly close. Of course, the mothers are going to be very protective. So again, it can be a little difficult to get close to them because the mother won't let you get particularly close to their youngsters. But if you can get within 10 or 20 meters, then uh, they do make wonderful photogenic targets. On one visit to a lake area, the East Africa is, is peppered with different lakes because it's part of the Great Rift Valley, which is filled with various lakes, some fresh water, some soda water. And as we approached one lake expecting to see Flamingo, we were treated to the sight of a thousand pelicans that took off and wheeled around over our heads. And we just weren't expecting that. And so the idea, remember pelicans are very big birds and this picture makes them look as small as seagulls, but they are actually huge birds. And yet there were hundreds, if not thousands of them in the air, wheeling around. It was a rather incredible sight and we were lucky to see that. In this area, we were expecting to find a dusty plain because we visited this particular part of a national park before uh, called Amboseli National Park. We've visited this in past years and it was basically just a dust bowl, just an open plain. And yet this year, for some reason, it had flooded. It wasn't necessarily a heavy rain that had preceded our visit. We were told that floodwaters simply come off Kilimanjaro and the water goes underground and every once in a while the water lifts and floods particular low-lying areas. So you can see it's not very deep, it's, uh, it's only uh, a few tens of centimetres deep as these zebras have no problem walking through it. Sorry about the pun here for the zebra crossing, but it just made a beautiful photograph of zebras moving from one point to another going across the lake 
They really couldn't be bothered to go round the outside and take the long route. They just crossed the water, realising that it was only uh, knee deep and hence it was not a problem for them to cross. It just gives a nice image of the zebras crossing, flamingos in the background and trees behind that. And again, this is not what we were expecting when we went to this particular national park. Yes, you can always get close to animals as long as you respect them and you don't make a sound and you don't wear very powerful aftershave and you don't scare them. Then you can get to within 10 meters of them. Even the prey animals, you can get relatively close to them and take some nice close up shots. Birds, well, that can be a problem if they're very small birds and they're a very long way away. But in this particular case, a fish eagle, an African fish eagle, was not so far away and so we could get a nice uh, shot of it. And as I said earlier, one of the advantages of digital photography with old fashioned film, if you blow up a small crop of an image, it can look a little bit grainy. But with digital images, you can take a picture of the whole bird and you can still blow up bits of it and get incredible amounts of detail as long as the original image is nicely focused. Not only getting close to lions, you can get close to cheetah. Again, they're not too worried about uh, visitors and tourists getting too close as long as they don't have young that they're trying to protect. And as long as you don't disturb them when they're in the middle of hunting for their next meal, then they're quite happy that you can get uh, relatively close to them. This particular lioness, we were perhaps encroaching on her territory. She did have cubs and I think she was being protective and giving us a damn good stare to make it clear that she wanted us to keep our distance in this particular case. So although it looks rather photogenic with the buttercups in, in the background etc, but uh, this was definitely a defensive posture of the lioness basically telling us that she was in charge and she didn't want us to get any closer. And you do have to bear in mind that in the wild, you are in the wild and some lodges do have electric fences to keep the uh, people safe. But in certain tented camps, for instance, on the left there, the inset shows you uh, a few tents and rather attractive area. But we were told don't go out at night. And the main image, you can see why. In the mud outside my tent one morning, I found this footprint, which I am told is a lioness footprint. So yes, during the night, predators will walk through the camp and hence during darkness, you're expected to stay inside your tent. For somebody like me who likes to photograph the night sky, this is a bit of a shame because there was no opportunity to do any astrophotography of the beautiful night sky in an area where if you don't have an electric fence, you have to put up with the fact that it's dangerous to go outside. So I limit my astrophotography during a safari to only those areas in which it is known to be safe to go out after dark. OK, I can't see you all, but I can sort of hear the yawns from here that, yes, OK, it's very nice to show all these pictures. But ultimately, yeah, OK, that's yeah, that was quite a lucky shot as well, although it's a, a nice shot of a leopard yawning. I actually managed to get a photo of its tonsils, basically, because I just happened to be in the right position so that when it yawned, I was looking straight down its throat and I couldn't again have hoped for a better shot of that particular leopard. But let me just remind you before I finish that uh, if you are thinking of wildlife photography, regardless of where it is, don't forget that if you're going somewhere nice to take pictures of animals, don't forget the rest of the views as well. If you're interested in photography, just look around and see what else there is to photograph. So, for instance, uh, if my friends and I go to East Africa, there's plenty of animals to photograph, but often there are spectacular views as well. In this particular case, a storm brewing over the Masai Mara, the, the, uh, the, the plains of the Serengeti in Tanzania and the Masai Mara in Kenya are all part of the same grassland system. And there can often be storms, depending on, again, which time of year that you go.
Some days you simply get nice views. This is nothing in particular. This is just early morning. The sun is coming in from the back, lighting up the seed heads of this particular view. And I just thought it was a very pretty and very green area, reminding you that not all of Africa is a dust bowl. There are some arid areas, but there are some very lush areas as well. And finally, I did catch my image of Kilimanjaro on a rather crisper day. So now you can see Kilimanjaro rising above the clouds and the ice caps on this particular day were very clear. Uh, I missed getting my string of elephants, a herd of elephants moving through the foreground, but you can't have everything. You get the elephants or you get the clear conditions. You would be very lucky to get both at the same time to get the perfect shot. Maybe that's a good reason for going back to East Africa at least one more time. And there's always the opportunity to get sunsets because it's not unusual to try and capture animals by going out in the early morning or the late afternoon. Quite often game drives are arranged for a couple of hours after sunrise and a couple of hours before sunset. Generally speaking, you don't go out in the dark because that's when animals are doing their hunting and they should be left alone to get on with catching their next meal. But catching the light around sunrise and around sunset is often the best time and so you often get dramatic opportunities for sunrise and sunset photos as well. And there's the iconic picture of an acacia tree in East Africa. I still haven't quite got the picture that I want because what I would like to get is a sunset picture with an acacia tree on one side and a giraffe on the other. The classic picture of Africa. Haven't got there yet. I need to go back for another visit and see if I can catch that picture. And it doesn't always work. I've shown you some of my pictures, some of my favourites, but you have to remind yourself that it doesn't always work. If you have a camera with photographic film, emulsions, 35 millimeter film, then you're quite precious about each picture you take. But with digital photography, of course, there's essentially nothing to be lost by just taking lots of pictures and then deciding that's rubbish, that's rubbish, oh, that one's nice. And it doesn't matter if you throw away pictures that don't work. If you're taking film, whether it be color print or um, color slide, it costs you money to get them processed. And so you are a little more precious about each picture you take. But with digital photography, there is, I must admit, quite often the tendency to shoot first and ask questions later. So you do end up with a number of shots which aren't quite what you wanted. For instance, this one, this was supposed to be a weaver bird. And the what you see on the left is a full nest of a weaver bird and on the right is a ring which is the start of a nest. The weaver birds pick up little bits of grass and start weaving it into a ring and then eventually into a full nest. So what I wanted to catch was the weaver bird on the nest with a little bit of grass in its beak starting to build the nest. But I simply wasn't fast enough. Small birds can move very quickly. And so I was uh, lining up the shot, about to take the picture, and by the time my finger was on the shutter release button, the bird had already flown away and was actually completely out of shot. Not even halfway out, it had completely left the frame by the time I'd taken the picture. And I've got quite a few shots like this where I wanted to catch a little bird and I just wasn't fast enough and it had flown away by the time I took the picture. So I have quite a few shots of empty branches. Not all of which I've thrown away, but basically, if anybody wants to see my empty branch collection, I'll show you some other time, perhaps. And occasionally you get beautiful views of animals coming towards you thinking, ah, right, there's a mother zebra and a foal zebra, a beautiful shot of them walking towards me. I pick up the camera. By the time I take the picture, they've changed their mind. They've turned around and are now walking away from me. So again, as well as having an empty branch collection, I also have a collection of animal bums because they've decided to walk away from me rather than towards me. Okay, it's still sort of a nice shot, but wasn't quite the one that I had intended and I wasn't quite fast enough to grab the camera and grab the shot that I wanted. So I've been saying a few things about how you should think about the composition and framing. You don't always have time. Sometimes you grab the picture and then re-decide later that you want it framed differently. 
It's good if you can keep things nice and sharp in focus. It's good if you can think about where the light is coming from and sometimes position yourself at different places to try and make the most of where the light is. If the light is coming from the low horizon, then think about getting it uh, on one side or the other rather than behind you, for instance. If you have time, you don't always have time, but if you have time, you can think about what is the exposure, the shutter speed, and what is the um, iris of the lens, the lens aperture. If you're happy to leave your camera on automatic, that's fine. If you've got a few seconds to spare, just think about whether or not it would help to take a different shutter speed or a different lens aperture. Given time, think about the context, the surroundings of the animal. And you can't do much about serendipity except be ready in case good luck ends up landing in your lap. So this is a picture I took a long time ago. I think this was about 43 years ago I took this picture. I think I was a teenager when I took this. It's black and white, not because that's more artistic. It's black and white because when I was a teenager I couldn't afford colour film. And so I did my own black and white processing. And this is a picture of our family cat taken, uh, as I say, many, many years ago. But although it was taken with film and although it's black and white, the same rules apply. Try and make sure it's well focused. I focused on the whiskers to try and make sure this was as sharp as possible. Don't shoot with the light behind you. If you can choose, in this case, the light was coming from our right hand side and lighting up the fur of our cat very nicely. Try and get the composition right. Try and throw the background out of focus so the detail of all the trees in the background there don't interfere with the subject of making sure that the cat stands out on the background. So my point is, it doesn't matter whether you are thinking about photographing your cat in your back garden or whether you're thinking of photographing big cats in Africa, the same guidelines apply. Thank you very much for listening.